Joe, thank you for joining me on our Thought Leader Spotlight Series. Uh, I'm your host, Matt Camp, Head of Partnerships for Deal Machine. Um, on these, we really try to shine a spotlight on industry experts like you, Joe, to hear uh, you know, your inspiring stories and really educate our audience on lessons that you've learned and really how you see the world evolving. So uh, today, I'm really excited to welcome on Joe Mendoza. Um, Joe's been involved in real estate for over 20 years. You've been you know, a broker, investor, consultant, mentor, a global coach. Um, you know, you share your knowledge as an author, a podcaster, you do, you do quite a few things, Joe. So you're a busy guy. Uh, I, I know, uh, you, and then I saw online as well that you were previously a top 1% performer in the entire nation when you were over at Prudential California Realty. So, um, you clearly know what you're doing here. Um, I know you're the, the president of the Joe Mendoza team out in San Diego. Uh, welcome on Joe. Excited to have you. Thank you so much, Matt, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, and, and really, like we'll we'll dive in together today on just lessons you've learned, um, especially through that last market crash and kind of common mistakes that you see, you know, people making in real estate. But um, to start, I'd love to get a little bit deeper about your story because I know um, you've t- you've shared with me and like how big of an impact, uh, you know, your your journey and your up your upbringing has had on your real estate and your success today. So. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit more about kind of your personal journey and, you know, how, how that impacted who you are today? Oh, absolutely. Thanks uh, again for allowing me the opportunity. Yeah. So my journey started, my dad was a uh, first generation immigrant from the Philippines here uh, and he joined the Navy. And so when he got to America, that's all he knew was Navy. Uh, when I saw him, you know, as I was growing up as a child, I saw him struggle. And every time he would like, reinforced, Joe, you got to be rich, you got to be rich, you know, and then one day, this thing about real estate came in my head, and I was in high school. Um, My uncle, actually, I was at his house hanging out with, uh, you know, my cousin, nephew, whatever. And he said, Hey, you know what, you got to check out the seminar. There's this guy in town, I heard lots of great things about him, you should check him out. And it happened to be Robert Allen. And I went to see him live. And I got inspired. And I was about 17 years old. And I was like, okay, how am I going to get in this game? I'm broke. I'm young. All these crazy excuses, right? That was limiting beliefs. And I said, hey, you know what, let's go to maybe college and get some of these classes out of the way while I was in high school. And so I took the real estate practice, real estate principles, real estate appraisal to lay out that foundation. And I thought maybe I should get my license to have that extra credibility. And unfortunately, the market crashed. Um, During that time, the market was crashing and burning. I got accepted to San Diego State. And I said, you know what, real estate or San Diego State? I went to San Diego State, ended up going there, got my um, degree, and then I got out. And then um, I thought, hey, I still need to be rich. (laughs) So so I ended up um, getting a job as a stockbroker trainee and that was kind of the path I was going on. And unfortunately, we had the dot-com bust. And that business model actually changed where, you know, stock brokerage, instead of these brokers, Wolf on Wall Street, that was me, Boiler Room, et cetera. Mm-hmm. They went into the online model, like the TD Ameritrades, the Scott Trades, et cetera. And it flushed that model out. And anyway, long story short, I started to explore real estate again. And I luckily had a friend that introduced me to a top producer who was doing about 100 transactions a year. And I latched on. And I went during my day job, I would go to at night and start prospecting expireds, canceled, just cold calling because I had that skill set from stockbroker training. And I got good. I got really, really, really good at it because as a stockbroker, I was, I was on the phone about 13 hours a day. And, you know, that kind of rejection, oh, well, got into real estate, it was actually a great, great training. And I started to run and I caught it at the right the right time because I already had the foundational classes for my broker license. Mm-hmm. So I thought, let's let's get my broker license. And out of the gates, um, I got my broker license in 1998, started getting into coaching, having great mentors started going from 10 transactions to 20 to 30 to 50 plus to um, 2005, I sold 113 homes. But during this journey, 
I started also getting into investing because I read that book right there, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I yep. really understood like, hey, you know what? A realtor is great, but an investor I think is more exciting. And so with that said, around 2001-ish, um, I pulled out about 113,000 cash from one of my properties. I started going really, really big. And I parlayed it into multiplexes, some syndications, some land development, single family flips. And I turned that 113,000, Matt, into over a million dollars in liquidity and assets. And the rest was history. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like too, through your journey, like, um, you know, one common thread is you saying like, I found this mentor, I found this person to teach me, I found, you know, this person to help me take it to the next level. Um, yeah. Can you share that with our audience a little bit more about like how you found mentors, you know, what, um, you know, how you really got involved, like the role that they've played in your life that way? Yeah. Uh, so my first mentor was that gentleman doing about a hundred transactions a year. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know about mentoring and coaching. I just kind of, followed followed what was in innate for me to do and at the time I guess luck or God or whatever you want to call it he was the 100 unit producer and I was one of his junior agents and luckily he was in coaching as well so he was a great mentor to me and he was in coaching and he really exposed me to the right path because me being a coach right now globally I see it's invaluable to have a coach because you can only get so far on your own devices and on your own talent and, and um, drive, but a coach, a mentor will help you get there faster, much faster, because you could get there certainly without a coach, certainly without a mentor, but a coach, a mentor will get you there faster, will help you mitigate the risk and share tons and tons of wisdoms and knowledge and see you and call you out on some of your blind spots because as me as a as a global coach you know i see people from barbados and canada and philippines here all over the us and some top top producers broker owners team leaders doing 5 million gci a year 200 300 sales a year you know massive monstrous teams and believe it or not they all have deficiencies or leaks in their business models. And so I find out that like, you know, they stay in this crazy path of like, sell, 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 sell. Yet meanwhile, nobody's coaching them, mentoring, like, hey, look to your left, look to your light, look on top, look below, because there's something going on here. You're not paying attention because you're so focused on either selling or growing a brokerage. And that's where I really start to get involved in their, in their business and their life. And also, Matt, that um, I mentioned that book earlier, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I asked, this, I asked this question to all the people I coach and mentor. I go, hey, have you read that book? Some of them say no, most of them say yes. And I, after that, Matt, check this out. What I do is I say, okay, great. Then what I do is I'll pull out this, hopefully some people are watching this on YouTube, but huh? I go, what does this mean, yeah. right? Yeah. And I hold this up. And they're like, they look at me like deer in the headlights, kind of dumbfounded. And I'm like, okay, you didn't read the book. You didn't understand the book. So I tell them like this. I say, hey, check this out. Most people in America are employees, okay? Then you become a realtor or a fix and flipper, okay? Good for you. You could work 10 hours, 12 hours, 16 hours a day. You could actually make more money. But what is the problem between being an employee and self-employed? And again, dumbfounded. I go, well, there's only 24 hours in a day. And then I say, hey, we got to move you into this category where you have a business owner and investor, right? And what's the great thing about this? And then again, they're dumbfounded. I go, leverage, 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 leverage. Yeah, you could work your tail off and be a great, great salesperson, a saleswoman, a salesman, and there's you're going to run out of time. When you go here into the business quadrant, investment quadrant, game over. Okay, now you could have financial freedom, abundance, peace in your life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, boom, finally a light bulb goes Clicks. off yeah. and it's like game over.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was one thing I was really curious about uh, you talking about your journey there, like how you made that transition, exactly what you're explaining of, um, you know, agent to investor and kind of going through that, like what we're looking back on that, what are some of the lessons that you learned from that? And how, how would you do that differently if, if at all? Thank you so much. So I love that question, Matt. So a couple of things I learned in 2008. So I was sitting on multi-millions of dollars worth of property. And then all of a sudden, we all know the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the lessons learned there is number one, uh, never become complacent. Because I was sitting on a lot of cash, a lot of property, and I was like feeling invincible. And so a lot of my ego got in the way and so I became complacent, okay? Number two, know your numbers. Know your numbers. Because at the time, I was banking a lot on appreciation, which a lot of people in today's market are doing too. Mm -hmm. We're like, hey, I just bought this house two years ago, and now it's went up 200000 300000 Whoopie do. Sell it and then buy another one. What they're not doing in single family or multifamily mobile home parks or storage is looking at the analytics behind that. Because I talk to and coach very, very sophisticated, sharp, sharp people. But when I run this other model, I say, okay, how do you figure out what cap rate, what value, what any of that is? Then I say, hey, who's your best friend? Then they tell me this random name. I go, no, that's not your best friend in investing. Your best friend now is Irv, okay? And with Irv, I go, okay, tell me what this means. Then they're starting to, again, dumbfounded. And I say, hey, net operating income divided by rate equals the value. Net operating income divided by value equals your cap rate. And again, like those are numbers I kind of high glossed it over, but there's other spreadsheets and analytics that I get into like, hey, what is your debt service coverage ratio? What is your internal rate of return? What is your cash on cash? And they're like blown away because I'm like, I lay it on thick. You know, the 1% rule, hey, buy a house for 400,000, make sure it rents for 4,000. But what not, they're not taking into place is all the other expenses. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, hey, if you're not looking at that part, Timmer, taxes, insurance, maintenance, management, utilities, reserves, you could be in major, major trouble. So that was the second lesson. I know it got a little bit long-winded on that one. No, and great. diversify, 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 diversify. You know, there's, there's two ways to look at your business in investing. So the fix and flippers that are out there, that's great. That's quick, immediate, today income, okay? But what they don't look at, what I didn't look at too much, is I had a good war chest, right? Equity and liquidity. But my downfall was I didn't have enough passive income. So that's what they're not paying attention to. So I would say, yes, the fix and flip game, it's awesome, but use that, some of that money to create passive income. Cash flow. Okay. Yeah, yeah cash flow. So I had some cash flow, but not enough. Okay. And it was one of these things <laughs> where, like, moving forward, I'm almost 50 now. So I'm like, I need to make sure that like when I'm 65, 70, 80 years old, I have a good amount of passive income, no matter what happens on mother earth that I'm set. And to the listeners out there, man, you really, really need to pay attention to this. Do not just play the short game. The short game is fix and flip, being a great realtor, making 10, 20, 50, a hundred thousand on one pop. That's a short game but not playing the long game where you're uh, creating passive income, you could get into serious trouble if you're not playing both games. Yeah. I mean, I, I know um, on previous calls, you've mentioned to me, like you've already kind of noticed the market potentially shifting a little bit here. Can you maybe speak to that? And, 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 you know, um, obviously, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but maybe your opinions on where the market is headed. Yeah. So my opinion on the market where it's heading. So, Last time, 2008, it started in single family and the dominoes started to collapse and then it get, got to commercial. This time, we're actually seeing a little bit of the reverse where it's starting commercial. Now it's the dominoes are collapsing and it's going to hit single family. How do I know? Well, it's quite common sense, guys. 
okay, when COVID hit, right, what happened? Restaurants shut down, businesses shut down. We had all these traumas happen in these businesses. Some restaurants will never ever open their doors again, okay? So who's paying those leases to the landlords? Nobody, okay? Who wants to rent those? Nobody, okay? So commercial is taking a major, major hit right now going on, okay? So what happens to the single person, the individual? Well, they're on either a PPP or EIDL or unemployment. Well, that only lasts so much and so long. And so I'll give you a totally true example. One of my clients right now, she was on a forbearance, okay? And she elected to go on forbearance right away. Now, we had all these moratoriums in place and like these protective laws for individuals not to foreclose, et cetera. But guess what happened, Matt, recently? It changed. <laughs> the, the, yeah. What happened was the bank was like, enough's enough. Mm -hmm. And so what they did was they filed the, they started the foreclosure proceedings. What they did was they filed a notice of default and it's like, uh-oh, there's a red flag. And that's one of many that I'm starting to see. Okay, so the commercial real estate is really taking a major beating. They're doing whatever it takes to go ahead and fill their doors and occupy all that square footage. But then now the trickling's coming down where now the single family come June, you know, these moratoriums in California are going to be lifted and like, hey, pay up rent or get evicted, you know, so it's, it's about to get ugly to a certain degree, but those that know how to navigate like I do will be able to be okay. Because I'll tell you what, Matt, in 2008 to 2011, 12, I've got a really, really old video on YouTube and I went through the analytics of like, hey, it's better to short sale right now because it'll probably take 10 to 15 years to recover. And I was absolutely correct, okay? Because I ran the math, I ran the analytics. And if you base appreciation on about 6% appreciation overall in America, I'm just kind of throwing a rough number. If you took like in California properties, let's just say were a million dollars and then they got slashed down to 500,000. If you did the math and you ran it through a 6% appreciation rate from 500,000 to a million, how long is it gonna take? And it took about 10 to 15 years. As a matter of fact, the house I was in was about a $2 million house over 5,000 square feet. I walked away. The banks wouldn't cooperate on a short sale. So I said, okay, forget it. I'm gonna walk away. Even 15 plus years later, Matt, that property never shot up, recovery. never shot yeah. up. Mm -hmm. So um, I, would, I would walk with caution, you know, but not fear. Walk with caution, but not fear. So I'm not trying to scare the heck out of everybody, but I gotta say like, hey, walk with caution and learn how to pivot. Because if you don't know how to pivot, you're gonna be in trouble. I mean, I went from regular realtor to all of a sudden doing like short sales and REOs, then back to traditional sales. And then being an investor, you got to, again, play the short game and the long game. I know in California, a lot of these flippers, all of a sudden, if they didn't know what to do, they upped and left or got out of the business completely. Well, one of my friends, he was developing here in San Diego. He pivoted. He goes, okay, writing's on the wall. So now he was starting to develop in like states like Missouri and the Midwest. And so like learn how to pivot. Don't be scared where you paralyze yourself, but make sure you learn how to pivot very, very quickly. Yep. Yeah, that's what I was curious. Uh, you know, we, we definitely have new investors and in, in people who are just getting into it. Plenty are going to be watching this. We do have more advanced investors as well, um, you know, that, that you know, have an established portfolio and all of that. So I, that's why I was curious, you know, uh, kind of seeing this and walking with caution for them. Like, what, what does that look like for them if they're a more, more advanced investor? Like, what are, what are the things that they should be taking precaution on? And like, how can they, you know, be ready to pivot or be kind of, you know, hedging their bets and things like that? That's a great question, Matt. So the more advanced and more sophisticated, okay, instead of running your vacancy at a 5%, run it at like a 15%. If your um, DSCR, debt service coverage ratio, is at a 1.25 or a 1.3, 
run it out of 1.8 or a 2%, okay? Your reserves, instead of having six months reserves, have a 12 month, a two year reserves, okay? So make sure your war chest is heavy for vacancies, unanticipated um, make readies. People are walking out and they're leaving a mess on your property. Well, make sure you have enough reserves to make it ready and rent again. When you're a fix and flipper, okay, you used to make your offers maybe 30% below market. Well, make your offers 40 to 50% below market. Make sure it's a true no brainer because if you're not making an offer um, and it's not within the 40, 50% below market and it's a true, true hemorrhager, a bleeder, and you're just doing it to try and make quota or finally like, hey, I got to, my goal was 10, I got to get 10 every month. And you're not paying attention to those numbers and really, really mitigating your risk or your ego is getting in the way and like, hey, ABC Flipper is doing 10 a month. I got to do 10 a month. No, it's not about what you're making. It's about what you're keeping. And guys, cash is king. It's okay to be cash heavy right now. Okay. And that's what I would share with whoever's listening in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we do definitely have, you know, one, that's phenomenal advice too. We definitely do have, um, you know, more uh, new investors who, you know, like you said, might be proceeding with caution. They might be like figuring out how do I, is it a good timing to get in the market? How I, how do I, how should I get in the market right now? Like, um, can you maybe walk through that mindset for new investors that want to get into it, but, but are, you know, proceeding with caution? So for new investors out there, you've always probably heard of this thing called wholesale. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great way to go because I would say like, you know what, find the deal because one of the hardest things in investing is finding the deal. And so like find the deal. But the second part of that is know who the other investors are and turn them into allies, because if they have deeper pockets, if they have more experience, well, go ahead and take 10,000, 20,000, 5,000 wholesale fee, okay? Rather than not knowing what you're doing, not knowing your budget, being under budget on a flip and get in trouble. Because if you make 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 on a wholesale fee, hey guys, at least you get to eat. One of my mentors used to say, man, Joe, I'd, I'd love to get the whole loaf, but if I can't get the whole loaf, I'd like a slice of the bread. Joe, if I can't get a slice of the bread, I'd like to get at least a crumb because Joe, guess what? At least I get to eat, okay? And that goes with the mindset of being a wholesaler. There's nothing wrong, ladies and gentlemen, about being a wholesaler. At least you get to eat, okay? So being greedy where you're like, hey, I'd rather make 50,000 than 5,000 could be right or wrong, depending the level of experience. And what some people pay, don't pay attention to is what if the market turns in two or three months? What if your holding costs kind of eat you alive? What if your budget you weren't paying attention to and all of a sudden you started ripping out the walls and now you found mold and you didn't anticipate mold. Now you got to go through the you know, mitigation of that. And so like really words of caution, like partner up with people, know your allies, investors in the market, wholesaling is totally, totally okay right now. Yeah. Yeah. And we, you know, definitely fit into that picture as well. Like we have plenty of people who are listening to this that are looking at wholesaling and, and trying to get into that and, you know, um, you know, working with us for that. So um, yeah, I love to hear that. I, I don't want to hold you too long today, Joe. I, I would say, um, you know, one last question I did have is I know you've talked in the past about having multiple exit strategies and the importance of that and how to think through that. Do, do you have any like kind of, you know, parting wisdom there of, you know, for, you know, anyone from the new investor to the advanced investor, how do you think through having multiple exit strategies and why that matters so much? Yeah. So going back to Robert Allen, you know, if you read his book, um, multiple streams of income and nothing down in the 90s that's where it all started and it was one of these things where I read his books he planted those seeds and let's just say your flip business starts to dry up well it's nice to have that passive income 
on multifamily, mobile home parks. And so my kind of strategy is really use this cash flow quadrant to your advantage. Like I am a coach, but it is self-employed, okay? But I love doing it. I really, really passionately love doing it and I'm okay with doing it. And to me, sometimes just because I love doing it, it's not really work, okay? So that is income. And what we call this side is active income. I know there are some part-time investors out there. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with being an employee. I mean, I know doctors and dentists and attorneys are considered employees, right? But they're making 500, 1,000 bucks an hour. So there's nothing wrong with that. So that's another stream of income. What they do should do is get into investing, okay? Buy some long-term passive in investments, also maybe start a business okay and so like why <laughs> well if you don't know who uncle sam is you got to make sure you find out who uncle sam is and talk to your tax professionals because if you don't have like a legitimate business chances are you're paying too much in taxes okay so you want to go ahead and really dive deep Look at your 1040s, your tax returns last year. For me, I coach a lot of people on their um, QuickBooks, and I really look at their P&Ls. I look at their balance sheets. I want to make sure that, like, hey, they're diversified with active income, passive income, multiple streams of income, you know, and believe it or not, you know, um, I love our affiliation uh, because there's also this thing called affiliate income. You know, and there's a lot of great, great people out there that are uh, leveraging that model as well, including yours truly. So I love that part of creating multiple streams of income as well. For sure. Yeah. No, I, and, and I appreciate your time today again, Joe. Like, it's been fantastic. I, I, you know, if, uh, if people want to get in touch with you, obviously you have your content, your book, your podcast. Can you kind of uh, give people, um, you know, ways to get in touch with you and get more involved? Absolutely. So, I love uh, my podcast show because I get to meet incredible people like yourself, Matt. You know, I would have never met you through if I didn't have my podcast. So best ways to get a hold of me, listen to my podcast, The Real Estate Raw Show. My books are on Amazon, Flex with a Plex. That's a beginner's guide basically to investing, make it a comeback. I think it really starts here with the mindset. If you don't have the right mindset, um, you know what, it's, it's going to be harder, a lot harder. So um, find me on Amazon, find me on YouTube, find me all over social media, go to JoeMendoza.com and I'm on there as well. Yeah, Joe, I, every time I talk to you, I really, uh, you know, enjoy our time together, come away inspired. So I appreciate you kind of giving people, uh, you know, the, the, the passion to move forward with what they're thinking about and, and you know, a playbook to do that. So I um, appreciate the time again today, Joe. Yeah, I really, really appreciate you and I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Well, to everyone that's watching, again, this is Matt Camp with Deal Machine and happy deal finding.